Well, welcome to the second part of Salvation History. We started uh, talking about this, the history, the uh, historical books of the Bible last week, and we got through two of them, two of the 14. So we have to get through 12 more to finish tonight, because tonight is the end of the presentation on divine revelation. It will be the third night that we spent on that topic. Um, so we got a lot to do, as always, but don't panic. Um, you still won't be here beyond 8.30, uh, and we are going to finish, because I've got it figured out. I hope. <laughs> okay. <laughs> totally hope. Um, I passed out the handouts, and I wanted to pass around this magazine, Catholic Answers. Uh, it's one of the only magazines that I actually, I, it comes out every two months. This is the November-December issue. And it's the only magazine that I actually read almost cover to cover. Uh, the other things that I get, I just glance through. Uh, so you might like this. Uh, this is published by an organization called Catholic Answers. When Jan and I went on that uh, Mediterranean cruise a few weeks ago, we, uh, we actually uh, went with that group, Catholic Answers, uh, and they, uh, they sponsored the tours that we took, the tour of the Acropolis in Athens and Ephesus, uh, Istanbul, uh, which is the ancient city of Constantine and things like that. Uh, so it's a wonderful organization. Their website is www.catholic.com and that's where you could, uh, that's where you can get, uh, maybe if you, if you want to, uh, get this magazine for yourself for Christmas or somebody else or have somebody get it to you for, uh, for you, I think it would be great. It's got a lot of very, very relevant articles in it. Um, so just pass that around uh, if anybody's interested in looking at that. Um, here, here's a copy of the, uh, of the handout for you. Yeah. Okay. So, last Monday... We got through Genesis and Exodus, and you may or may not remember all that we said about that, um, but we started out by talking about the first five books of the Bible that are called, what are they called? The Pentateuch, excellent, which means five books, right? What else could they be called? The Torah, right. The Torah in uh, Hebrew is the law, right? And in the Hebrew Bible, the, uh, the, uh, the Torah is the, has pri primacy. It's the most significant of the uh, books of the Hebrew Bible. Okay? This, they count them as 24. The Protestants count them as 39 just because they're arranged differently. And... Uh, we Catholics actually have 43. But I already explained to you uh, on our first night of divine revelation why we have those seven extra books. Okay? Uh, so we won't go, go through that. But we're still working on the Pentateuch. Uh, the next book that we're going to do uh, is uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Leviticus and Numbers uh, and Deuteronomy, and then we're going to move on to Joshua and the other historical books, okay? But before we do that, let me just review what the, uh, the theological themes of Genesis and Exodus were, just so you can remember them from last week, and maybe a couple of you weren't here last week. Uh, what's most important are these themes, and the reason the themes are most important is because they are the theological points that that literature makes. You have to understand that the Pentateuch especially in the Bible cannot be read, can, cannot be read as history. Can't be read like a modern novel because it's not. Uh, one has to really understand that the Pentateuch was written 500 to 1,000 years after any of those events took place. The story of these events uh, the stories of these events were handed down orally for generations before they were finally written down. All right. 
So there was a certain amount of editing and redaction and embellishment done. Okay? But we believe, and all Christians believe, and so do the Jews, that these books were inspired by God. In other words, the human authors were telling their stories, but God was getting a message to us, to the world, through those stories. And those are these theological themes. That's why I think they're so important. They actually might be more important than the stories themselves. right? Uh, and so when we started with Exodus and we start with, sorry, with Genesis and the story about creation, what was it telling us? It was telling us about the pre-existence and the transcendence of God, right? That he existed before time and matter uh, and that he transcends uh, time and, uh, and, sp and space. And it was his power through which all things were made. Uh, and what method he used to actually create the universe and the world that we live in and life itself, whether that was a literal creation in seven days or a process of evolution over millions of years, <clears throat> um, that is up for that. That is something for science to decide, and science would um, would probably unanimous, unanimously say that God used the process of evolution to bring about life as it is today on Earth. Okay, and that's okay. That's nothing wrong with that. There's no contradiction as long as we understand uh, the scriptures that we're reading. There was a special part of creation, and that was creating man. Now, even if God used evolution to do that, at one point he breathed the soul into the first, uh, the first human being, and we call that Adam and his wife Eve, right? And that was a special part of God's creation because this was a creature, a created a being, that, that God wanted to have a personal relationship with. This was uh, a creature that was given the gifts of reason and free will, which the other creatures didn't have. We also see in Genesis the institution of marriage. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife and the two become one. We saw man's sin of pride and disobedience as Adam and Eve disobeyed God. But we saw that God didn't abandon them and he promised salvation. And the beginning of that salvation starts with Abraham, the father of the uh, Israelites. right? And the entire world would be blessed by his uh, descendants. Later on in Genesis, uh, we see some other themes. One of them is whenever we fall out of right relationship with God and others, we no longer experience paradise. That's the story of Adam and Eve and the fall from grace and them being uh, ejected from the Garden of Eden. Uh, but after that, we, we read about Noah and, and the story of Noah and his family being saved from the flood that destroyed the whole world at that time uh, is that faith and faithfulness are the arcs of salvation. That's how we're saved, by, be, by faith and being faithful to our call. We heard this, the Tower of Babel last week, and the theme of that is that only by discovering and participating in the divine plan, not our own plan, can we accomplish what we actually want, what we were made for in the first place, and that is to be partakers of the divine nature. Uh, and God is faithful to his promise, even if people aren't so faithful. Because even the patriarchs like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, and even Joseph, you know, when we read their stories, we find out that they were only human and weren't always faithful. When we got to Exodus, the story of, of the... Uh, the Genesis told us, at least at the end, it told us how the Israelites got into captivity, how they got into slavery, in, uh, or at least how they got into Egypt. In the book of Exodus, we he hear how eventually uh, their time in, in Egypt ended up as a time of slavery. Uh, 
And though they were enslaved, God called someone, namely Moses, to lead them out of that condition, right? And the themes are that we have to put our trust in God. Moses initially didn't know how God was going to do this, especially through him, because the Pharaoh didn't want to let his people go. But we must persevere, and even persevere in prayer. Uh, By the time we get to Mount Sinai and the Ten Commandments, the theme is that we must love and respect God. That's what the first three commandments are all about. Uh, and we'll spend, uh, we'll spend some time when we talk about Christian morality on the commandments. Because the other seven commandments have to do with how we love our neighbor. Uh, as, the, uh, as the Israelites were, uh, and we'll see this especially in the, in the book of uh, Judges, as they were wandering in the desert uh, on their way to the Uh, promised land, and even on their way to Mount Sinai, and after that, uh, the Lord sustained them. When they left Egypt, they complained to Moses that, uh, hey, in Egypt, at least we had food. We were slaves, but we had food. Here in the desert, we're starving. Uh, And that's when God sustained them with manna. So, naturally, the story of that is God will provide divine providence. So this is what we saw as far as the events. We read about creation. We read about the first man and woman, Adam and Eve. Uh, We read about Noah and his family being saved from the flood. Uh, We read about Abraham, the father of the Israelites, and his wife, Sarah, and his son, Isaac, and his wife, Rebecca. Isaac's son, Jacob, eventually called Israel, and his two wives, Leah and Rachel, uh, And their 12 uh, sons became the 12 tribes of Israel. One of their sons, uh, one that Rachel was particularly fond of because it was her uh, son by her, uh, was Joseph. And uh, Joseph's brothers were jealous. And so they, they sold him into slavery. And that's how he ended up in Egypt. When he got to Egypt, he was quite quite outstanding, Uh, even though he ended up in jail, right, because uh, there were some some people that uh, maliciously tried to get him into trouble. But anyway, um, he he gained a reputation, and the pharaoh had a dream, uh, and his people couldn't interpret the dream, but he heard about this... this, uh, this, uh, Israelite boy, Joseph, and he called for him, and Joseph interpreted the dream. And the dream meant that there would be seven years of a bountiful harvest, and then seven years after that of starvation because there was, there was just no rain, uh, no harvest. And so the Pharaoh was able to store up grains and things uh, in the seven good years, and he had it made in the seven bad years while the countries around him were starving. And that's when uh, <clears throat> the sons of Jacob uh, came to, e- to Egypt to, um, uh, to seek some food because they were starving. And by that time, Joseph was made the prime minister and they're the ones he had to go to. Now, they didn't recognize him, but he knew who they were. Uh, and he reconciled with them and and in fact, all of the Israelites entered Egypt and into the best ear area of Egypt called Goshen. Yeah, I compared it to John's Creek in the Atlanta area. Uh, and so uh, they really had it made in Egypt. And that's how, uh, that's how the book of Genesis ended. When we got to Exodus, the problem is Joseph died, that Pharaoh died, and it's several generations later, and now the current pharaoh is worried about the, uh, the uh, Egyptians, uh, the, the Israelites, <laughs> not the Egyptians, uh, saying that, hey, they're getting too powerful. Uh, in fact, uh, he was trying to reduce them by having the firstborn killed. Uh, and uh, so, uh, actually, Moses was saved, first ma- the males killed, uh, And Moses was actually saved from that because 
his mother puts him in a uh, basket floating down the river. The Pharaoh's daughter finds him, and now the uh, Moses is brought up in luxury in the Pharaoh's palace. Uh, but he realizes that he's, he's an, a, an Israelite, and he sees the Israelites being enslaved and tortured and beat. In fact, uh, to prevent something like that, in a particular case, he kills an Egyptian slave master and he runs off. That's where he meets God in an incident called the burning bush, where he sees, he sees this bush aflame and, uh, and it's not burning itself out. He comes over and has a conversation with God. Uh, in fact, at the end of the conversation, he asks God, who should I tell the Israelites? What should I tell them your name is? And that's when he said, Yahweh, I am in Hebrew. Okay? I am who am. In other words, there is no name. Uh, and so um, we read about the Passover, how Moses tries to negotiate with Pharaoh, set my people free. And God sends plagues against them because he won't do it. And finally he gives up and he says, get out of here. And they're on the run. Uh, and uh, they pass through uh, the Red Sea. And they have to pass through the Red Sea. Moses has to part the sea because the, uh, the Pharaoh's troops came after them, even, the, even though the uh, Pharaoh had let them go. Uh, and... Uh, but they were able to pass through the Red Sea, which parted when Moses raised his hands and uh, they made it to dry land on the other side. And uh, uh, when the Egyptians tried to come through, uh, with the, they were bogged down in this. And uh, by the time they, they worked their way into it, the water collapsed on them and they were destroyed and the Israelites were free. That's the idea of the Passover. Uh, besides the fact that before they actually left uh, Egypt, the last, the last one of the plagues, the one that changed Pharaoh's mind, was uh, a, uh, uh, a killing of a uh, male firstborn, right, uh, by an angel of death. And they would, he would know who the Israelites were because the Israelites would sacrifice an unblemished lamb and spread that life, that uh, blood on the doorposts. And then the angel of death would pass over them uh, and they would not be affected by this particular uh, uh, plague on Egypt. Anyway, all right, so now you know how they got into Egypt and now you know how they got out of Egypt. Uh, and they are headed for Mount Sinai where Moses receives the Ten Commandments. Uh, and from there, they will head to the Holy Land. We'll hear about, uh, we'll hear about that. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and that's basically the story of where we left off last time. I highlighted on here some particular individuals, Adam, Noah, Abraham, and Moses, for a reason. Because... Uh, they are part of the the of ki of covenant theology. Remember this slide. This is important because this shows the uh, the history of covenant salvation. Okay, a covenant is a sacred family bond, and that's the bond that God wanted to have with human beings. In order for that bond to really happen. Um, for a relationship to be established, um, things had to be done. Uh, and there were two parts of, this, of these covenants. The, it, would, it would be that, that, that God would provide and have a relationship uh, and provide salvation for his people, but at the same time, the people had to fulfill their part. They had to... Uh, uh, he, they had to let God be God in their lives and not worship other gods. And so the covenant started out very simply with a couple, and the couple was Adam and Eve. Uh, 
and we hear about the marriage covenant and also God's promise of salvation even after their fall. But it was a covenant with a couple. By the time we got to Noah in chapter 9, the covenant was expanded because Noah and his whole family were saved from the flood in the ark, right? So the covenant goes, and, and God made a covenant with, with Noah and his family that he would know, uh, in the future would not destroy the world with a flood like he did, no matter how bad men get, uh, but, and that they would repopulate the earth. Okay? And by the time we get to chapter 12 and Abraham, now the covenant has expanded from a couple to a family to a tribe because Abraham, called the father of the Israelites, uh, was really part of a tribe. It was a tribal type of culture. Okay? And God made another covenant with Abraham and told him that if he was faithful to God, left where he came from, the land of Kol Ur, you are, uh, and followed God's instructions, which he did, uh, that he would be, uh, he would have many descendants and the entire world would be blessed by them and they would have their own land called the promised land. By the time we get, we get to Moses that we just talked about, we're in Exodus now, in chapter 12, uh, and the covenant is expanded again because now we hear for the first time of Israel being considered a nation. So we're going from a couple to a family, to a tribe, to a nation now. Uh, and God makes this covenant with Moses at Mount Sinai. Right? Uh, it expands. And God is expecting more from his people also because now he's giving them the detail of the Ten Commandments. Right? The Decalogue, it's called. By the time we get to David, which we'll be talking about in a few minutes, now the year is 1000 BC. Uh, you'll see this chronology in a minute. Uh, now the um, covenant has expanded because we hear about Israel as a kingdom. A kingdom has more worldwide influence than a nation does. And so uh, uh, God makes a covenant with David, and it's from David directly that Jesus is descended. Uh, and then, of course, we have the new covenant through Jesus, right? Uh, the old covenant is, is, um, is fulfilled in Jesus, the promises of God and the, uh, and the uh, prophets are fulfilled in Jesus. And Jesus is the one who established the church where we are now and in the age of the church and a new covenant is expanded yet again because Jesus said, go into all nations, make disciples of all nations. And now it's a worldwide covenant, a Catholic or universal covenant. So a couple to a, a family, to a tribe, to a nation, to a kingdom, and then to the entire world. Okay. So this is the chronology of it, of the approximate dates of it. Creation, if we look at it this way, literally, if we took it literally, uh, would have occurred somewhere around uh, the year 4000 BC. When I say BCE is typically how scholars uh, designate the time before Christ, and it means before the common error. And after Christ is C.E., common error, okay? You might want to use B.C. for before Christ and A.D. for after Christ, which is Latin for year of our Lord, okay? Um, but this, in, in, in scholarly writings and textbooks that I read, this is the way they put it, okay? I got this slide right out of the textbook. Uh, the flood, Noah and that flood, would have taken place around 2400 BC, Abraham and the Abrahamic covenant would have taken place somewhere around 2100 BC. The descent into Egypt, that's Jacob's uh, sons and their tribes, I mean, and uh, being allowed into the Goshen area of uh, Egypt by Joseph, their brother, the prime minister of Egypt, uh, around 
1875 B.C. The Exodus escaped from Egypt. They had, you see how many years now, you're talking, they, they, they had been in Egypt for quite a while. Uh, and, uh, what, 330 years or something like that. Uh, at 14, 1445 B.C. and then King David, as I had said before, around 1,000 years before Christ. Okay, you know the five books of the Pentateuch? What are they? Right. Genesis, Exorcist, uh, Exorcist, <laughs> Exodus, <laughs> Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Right? That's something that everybody should know because they are the primary scriptures of the Old Testament. All right? So if you don't know that, it might be something good to memorize. Uh, but Leviticus, we're not going to spend any time on except this slide, right? The, the word Leviticus means basically the way to holiness, right? The way to sanctity. Uh, and the first half of it, that's um, chapters 1 to 16, are laws prescribed actually for priests. And initially, the father of every family was... Uh, a priest. That was God's initial intention. But after the golden calf incident, the Israelites worshiping the golden calf when Moses was up on the mountain acquiring the Ten Commandments, okay, um, now only the tribe of Levi was, were designated priests. And the reason for that was they did not worship the golden calf. All right? Well, anyway... Um, the first 16 chapters are laws prescribed for priests, what they were to do and how they were to do it, right? And then the, the other part of it, 17 through 27, is about how one lives uh, the laws that they follow in order to acquire sanctity or holiness. And it talks about all of these things, the Levites themselves as priests and and worship ceremonies, offerings, uh, sacrifice, uh, cleanliness, right? It, it even talked about how before you deliver a baby, you're going to wash your hands, okay? Um, and uh, atonement for sin, uh, the ordination of priests, uh, what holiness and sanctity actually is. Uh, it is the beginnings of an actual uh, calendar of festivals, uh, and there were in, in, additional instructions to Leviticus is one of the hardest books to read in the Old Testament. Numbers is the next book, and that talks a lot about the wilderness years, the years that uh, the Israelites spent, and it's almost 40 years that they spent wandering in the wilderness before they eventually were able to cross the Jordan River into the Promised Land. Why was that? Well, that's because they refused to um, trust in God. They sent, um, they sent spies across the Jordan River to the so-called promised land, and the spies came back saying, we got a problem. I don't think we should go over there because those Philistines over there, they are big and they are bad and they're going to crush us. And so instead of having faith in God, who was telling them through Moses that they should actually enter the Holy Land, even Moses was afraid to do it because of what the, uh, what the spies came back and reported. And so because of that, none of Moses, none of that generation made it. They wandered for 40 years. That's, a, that's the length of a generation in, in, uh, in the uh, biblical terms. And so... Moses never made it into the, into the promised land, nor did that generation. It would be the next generation, the generation of, of, uh, of Joshua, that would actually enter the Holy Land, right? So the book of Numbers tells us a story about those 40 years that Israel spent in the wilderness and what happened. Uh, uh, they went from, they were going from Mount Sinai the Ten Commandment place, they were going from there to Canaan, which is the promised land, and it took them all that time, no direct route. 
uh, because of their refusal to enter, their disobedience, their refusal to enter Canaan. Okay? They didn't think they could do it. They didn't trust. And during those 40 years, they weren't just left alone to wander in the desert. No. They had wars. Wars with different groups and tribes. And so if you read Numbers, you would hear about their conflicts with the, uh, the Amorites and the Midianites and others. And wars that took place on the plains of Moab. Uh, and we even hear... Wait a minute. Wait a, we even hear about the next generation. The next generation is Joshua and Caleb. They will be the ones to lead the Israelites in the next book that we study into the Holy Land. In fact, drawing numbers at the very end, Joshua is commissioned for that job. Yes? Um, what's the difference between the war and they are just different tribes, different, you know, as the, uh, it was very common. That was a very warlike period of history, something that we're not used to today, especially in North America, you know, where we don't have involvement in wars like other areas of the world do. It's something that we're not used to. But uh, if, if you were a, a people passing through, you were a nomadic people uh, that lived and traveled, there, and you were passing through someone else's land, they might just attack you because they want your women, your children, and your, your gold and whatever possessions you have, and they want to use the men as slaves. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, that was, that's what Numbers is all about. I want to spend, even though this isn't, a, this isn't one of the historical books, I want to spend a, a, just a few minutes on Deuteronomy. Okay. Uh, it's the last book of the Pentateuch. Uh, it is, Deuteronomy means like the second law, Deutera, second, the second law, another book of laws. Uh, but you could say that this book is a book of covenant life, more of, um, more, less practices, but who you are in your relationship with God. And in it we have some of my favorite Old Testament scriptures, my very favorite Old Testament scriptures. And everyone should have favorite scriptures. And you probably do, and they're probably uh, verses from the New Testament. But you might not have a favorite Old Testament verse, so I want to share with you what mine are. Uh, but we hear in Deuteronomy, and I'm going to share uh, just a couple of things from you, we hear sermons or ex exhortations of Moses as he has his last words with the Israelites. He knows he's not going to make it into the Holy Land. Uh, and, uh, and he keeps on telling the people what God has done for them, and he's trying to get them to remain faithful. Right? Uh, Deuteronomy 6 is one of my favorites. And it is about covenant life. In other words, keeping your part of the covenant, and don't worry, God will keep his part, right? And obedience to the law. And so let me share with you uh, one of my favorite scriptures from uh, the sixth chapter of Deuteronomy. It's called the Great Commandment. And see if you've ever heard this before. Now, imagine this. This is... This is um, Moses, in his final days, making his last plea to the Israelites. They haven't been faithful. God has been faithful. They haven't been faithful. So he makes his last plea. He says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Therefore you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Take to heart. These words which I enjoin on you today, drill them into your children. Speak them whether you're at home or abroad, whether you're busy or at rest. Bind them on your wrist as a sign. Let them be a pendant on your forehead. Write them on your doorposts of your houses and on your gates. How much more could he implore? This is the most, some of the most dramatic words in the entire Old Testament. But where did you hear these words before? 
Exactly. Exactly. That's exactly right. When the Pharisees came to Jesus and they asked him, what are the two most important commandments, trying to trick him up, whatever he said, he'd be not paying attention to the rest of them. He said, and he quoted from right here from Deuteronomy 6, he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. That's the first commandment. And it sums up everything. Uh, and the second commandment is like that. Love your neighbor as yourself. The two of them together are like the entire law and the prophets all put together. Okay? Uh, so that is a, is a great one. The next one I want to share with you is from uh, the 30th chapter of Deuteronomy. It's just a few pages after that. These chapters go quickly. Uh, but this is where he's asking for their absolute commitment and asking them to choose life. And this is very dramatic. This is probably the most dramatic words of all. Here then... I have today set before you life and prosperity, death and doom. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I enjoin on you today, loving him and walking in his, in his ways and keeping his commandments, statutes and decrees, you will live and grow numerous and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to occupy. If, however, you turn away your hearts and will not listen, but are led astray and adore and serve other gods. I tell you that you will certainly perish. You will not have a long life on the land that you are crossing the Jordan to enter and occupy. So I call heaven and earth today to witness against you. I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. Choose life. Right? That's great. That's, it's so dramatic. I could just see Moses on the plains of Moab screaming that out to the people, trying his last chance to get them to keep their part of the covenant. We also hear about the call and commission of Joshua, and we hear about the last days and the death of Moses at the end of Deuteronomy. And so we have now completed the Pentateuch. It took us all... An hour and a half last week to just go through the first two books. Now we just did the last three books of the Pentateuch. Okay? Because it's, um, it's not as, we're not going into as much detail. Because uh, we had to go into more detail in Genesis and Exodus because it sets the, it sets the story for the rest, uh, the rest of it. Okay? All right, so... Now it's finally time for them to enter the promised land. The promised land that, Je that, that uh, God had promised to Abraham, the first patriarch, from the beginning. Okay? So what do we read about in Joshua? It's called the Book of Conquest because they're conquering the Holy Land. They're just not going to walk in there like a parade, waving banners. Here we come, we're the Israelites. You know, oh, no. Those, it, you, you would think maybe it was that, but it, it isn't. So while we hear about them crossing the Jordan River and entering um, Cana, entering the Promised Land. But once they get there, what happens, right? The people who are there, the Canaanites, are not happy that they're coming into their territory. So you have wars and battles and we hear about the central campaign that, that takes place in approximately the center of this geographical area. And in that, the conquest of Jericho. Remember the conquest of Jericho? Uh, the Israelites march around the city. And, the, and, uh, and uh, the, uh, they blow the trumpets. And the walls fall down. And they come into the city and they take it over. Right? You can read that. Uh, it's not a real long story, uh, but it's a good story of them trusting God and following, uh, uh, following instructions and trusting that, that, that God would uh, keep his promises. We hear about the northern and southern campaigns after that central campaign. Uh, and in the end, Joshua renews the covenant and they are planted uh, finally in the promised land. 
Joshua is another difficult book to read. And when you read it, a lot of people who read it, I had one, uh, one uh, family here in the parish that sent me an email and said, we just read Joshua. Uh, they homeschool their children uh, and they, they do biblical studies with them. Uh, there is a commendable, a very commendable uh, uh, family. And, uh, but Mary Mormon, the mother, she called me, uh, she, well, she emailed me and she asked me, you know, I, I don't understand this. Because in the book of Joshua, we have the Israelites killing entire tribes of people, women and children included and all that. Like, and, and, and the book of Joshua is claiming that they got instructions to do that from God himself. Right? That's why it's a very difficult uh, book to read. And what I told her is you cannot read this as if it's history. The authors, again, uh, in a whole different period than this period, uh, felt, they felt that God was ordering them to do this, to enter this land. But you cannot read this uh, like, like history, right? Uh, this, this, was, this was a very violent time. It was kill or, or be killed and uh, things that are very, very hard for us to understand. And, um, and again, uh, the themes, when we, especially when we see the themes of Joshua, are more important than the historical details because the historical details will, uh, you know, will, will not be how we're used to historical details in a modern, uh, in a modern history textbook or anything like that. Okay. So that's, that's something you've got to know. Here are what the, the, the theological themes are. Here's what's important to us about today about Joshua. It's a matter of trusting in the power of God. And when they did that, they were able to conquer uh, situations like, uh, like Jericho. It takes faith and faithfulness. And even though people aren't perfect... God meets them where they are and calls them forward one step at a time. And he did that with the Israelites as they entered Cana uh, and finally were able to settle there. And, you know, you can let the Lord go to battle for you. You know, Jericho is a good example of that. Because God is always faithful even when we're not. Okay? And we have to each decide for ourselves. Either God is God or not. Right? Either he's everything, if he is God, or he's nothing. And so everyone has to answer the question, who is God in my life? And am I going to let God be God or not? Okay, at the, on your last page of this handout, you have this, a large size of this so you could actually see it. All right. So how far did we get? All right, well, we got through Adam and Eve in creation. We got through the Tower of Babel. We got to Noah. We got to Abraham and how he left his nice, lovely place of Ur and followed God's, uh, God's uh, instructions uh, as the founder of the Israelite nation. Um, we, we got through Moses and how he led the Exodus. We got through Joshua and how uh, under him they were actually able to enter and conquer the promised land. And now we'll get to our next historical book. And I have two of them on one slide here. Judges and 1 Samuel in our list of the 14 books. See how good we're doing now? We're really on a, on a run. Okay. I have some names highlighted in here because these are significant individuals, okay? Gideon is significant, and again, you'll have to, you'll want to read this um, uh, for more details. In fact, I gave you um, the handout, the handout that I gave you tonight is about how to read scripture, okay? 
how, if you were going to read the Bible, where you would start. What we're hoping is that um, these sessions that we do uh, will inspire you to maybe uh, dive in deeper. And that handout is about reading the Bible and, and, uh, and diving in deeper. And you'll also see in there something very similar to what I said about not treating this type of literature as literal history. Okay. Uh, all right, in Judges, we hear about Gideon, and he goes to war for the Israelites, and he defeats some of, the, uh, uh, some of their uh, most um, dangerous enemies, I would say. We hear the story of Samson and Delilah, and that's a piece of literature that almost everybody has heard, the story of Samson and Delilah. Uh, you'll, have to, um, uh, you'll have to read that because we can't spend any time on, on things like that. I'm just pointing them out because they're, they're significant and they're, and they're, they're, they're literature that, that, that most people have, have heard about. But here's what's important about Judges. What we see in the book of Judges is crisis cycles in the Holy Land. The Israelites have crossed the Jordan. They're established in the Holy Land. They're actually living there now. And they go through cycles of crisis. What happens is they begin to fall into sin. How do they sin? By breaking the covenant. All right? How do they break the covenant? By worshiping other gods and doing the things that their neighbors, pagans, do, okay? Which means immorality. So they start living like their neighbors. Hey, you know, it's like us living like the rest of the world does, right? Uh, that doesn't have a personal relationship with God through Christ. Uh, okay, so when they sin like this, what happens? They don't win their wars, they lose their wars, and they end up as slaves of another nation. And then once they're in slavery, they get on their knees and they cry out to God in supplication. Right? And what does God do? He goes, all right, I'll give you another chance at this covenant. And he provides salvation for them. And now they're grateful and they serve God. And when they do, they prosper. But when they're prosperous, when they're prosperous and everything is going well and there's plenty of money and plenty of food and, and all that, what happens? They fall into sin again because things are too easy. And once they fall into sin, someone conquers them and it's slavery again. And so you have the S's, right? Sin, slavery, supplication, salvation, serving God, and then prospering, pr prospering, and, and then that cycle is repeated over and over and over again, okay? Uh, and uh, so that's important because that's the, the main theme of Judges is that, uh, is that cycle. And that taught the world a lot uh, about living up to the covenant. What happens if you do? What happens if you don't? Okay. After Judges, the next, next historical book is 1 Samuel. Um, there was kind of a downfall of the Judges. You know, it, it was almost like the Judges, who were the leaders of the Israelites during that period, right, where they, they lived in the Promised Land, uh, they, they became corrupt at the end. And there was a downfall of judges. So now there's no more judges. And we start hearing about uh, high priests. And Hannah wants a son and she prays for a son and she has Samuel. And Samuel becomes a high priest. And that high priest is important because the rest of the history of Israel will have high priests. Okay? Well... The people of Israel at this point, they wanted a king. This is significant in their history. They wanted a king. The other nations around them, the pagan nations, had kings, and they wanted a king. 
And so, they would be a kingdom. And God actually was warning against this. He warned against it in Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 14 through 20, he talked about the WWW, and I don't mean World Wide Web by that. Okay. It's weapons or warfare, wealth and wives. There was a warning that leaders and kings of countries drawing that period of world history would store up weapons in order to go to war um, with other countries and confiscate their wealth, right? And they would, they would stack up wealth for themselves. They became greedy. And they would have numerous, numerous wives. And these are things that God warned about. And the reason why, he says, I want to be your king. I don't, you don't need a king. But they kept on imploring God for a king. And so he says, all right, I warned you about the three W's. So here's your king. So Samuel anoints Saul. Saul becomes the first king of the Israelites. Uh, Israel is a kingdom. But it doesn't last long. Okay? Uh, he's anointed by Samuel, the high priest. He defeats the um, Ammonites, another tribe, local tribe. Uh, but he makes a mistake. Okay? He offers sacrifice. He's not a priest king. He's just a king. He wasn't allowed to offer sacrifice. We read about that in 1 Samuel 13. Okay? And God decides to replace him with another king. And he goes to Jesse. Jesse is David's father. And he says, I would like to, you know, see your sons. And so God looks at the sons of all of them. I mean, through, through Samuel. Um, and, but that's not it. Don't you have another son? Yes, he's, he's tending to the flocks. Oh, bring him in. And that's David, right? And David, David ends up being a hero. We read about the story of, of uh, David and Goliath, right? Uh, and David and Saul... Saul is jealous of this situation. David and Saul get into a battle and there's quite a lengthy story and it's very funny about the battle that took place between Saul, the first king, and David, the second king of Israel, right? Uh, because they went after each other. Uh, and that story is, is the ending of 1 Samuel and it brings us into 2 Samuel. There's uh, David and Goliath. Goliath was a big, bad, uh, uh, a big, bad Canaanite, or uh, Philistine. Uh, and, uh, and they were known to be pretty big compared to the Israelites. Uh, and you can read that story. You've probably heard it of David actually knocking him out with a, a slingshot. <laughs> okay, 2 Samuel. You know that there are also uh, there are also First and Second Chronicles. That, that First and Second Chronicles isn't on our list because it kind of parallels Second Samuel and First Kings. So uh, that's why we stayed away from the Chronicles because they're, they're, they're kind of parallel stories. All right? uh, but when we get into Second Samuel, we hear about Saul's death. He actually fell on his own sword, uh, and the anointing. Of King David. And this is significant because this is one of the covenants. All right? David is very, very significant. Uh, in fact, under David, they actually, the Israelites actually conquer the actual city of Jerusalem. Uh, where David wants to, he, he wants to build a temple. Okay? It would have been the first temple. They defeat the Philistines, they were the biggest enemies. And in the most significant place, Jerusalem, right? So that's a big event in the history of the Israelites. And it parallels, at this point, we start getting into 
more real history because it parallels extra biblical, in other words, uh, history that we find uh, in uh, archaeological discoveries and things like that uh, and literature from those times and those other countries, those other peoples. Uh, David brings the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem, right? And he is actually anointed as a priest king. A little different than Saul was, right? God is trusting him with more. And he makes a special covenant in 2 Samuel ch chapter uh, 7 with David and says it's from your direct heir that the Messiah will be, right? And Jesus was, uh, but then there's a problem. This is a good period of time in the United Kingdom and everything, right? This is a good, good period of time. This is the peak of Israel. Okay? But then there's a problem, and the problem is caused by, bless you, the problem is caused by David's sin. He is um, on the roof of his palace one day, uh, and he, um, he looks down at another building, and he sees a young lady named Bathsheba. All right, and, um, and he says, boy, she's a babe. <laughs> and so he calls his people. He says, bring her to me. All right, and, um, and he has a sexual relationship with Bathsheba. But Bathsheba's married, so this is adultery. And her husband is Uriah. And her husband's significant, too, because it's one of David's generals. And he's out fighting the battle, by the way. And so while he's out fighting a war, David is making out with Bathsheba, his wife. Not good, okay? Um, and that was what led to the problems, okay? Um, actually, uh, David lamented... Uh, for this whole thing, but it got worse before he did. Uh, you see, Bathsheba became pregnant with this affair, this adulterous affair. And um, so David says, what am I going to do about this? And he calls Uriah in from the battle and says, hey, look, it, why don't you take a few days off or a few weeks off? Uh, make love to your wife um, and then you can go back to the battle, okay? To make it look like it was Uriah's baby and not his, okay? Uh, but he goes, I will not do it. My men are fighting and dying. I won't do it. I'm going back to the, to the front lines. So David, he sends a message that in the heat of the battle for the troops to withdraw, leaving Uriah up there when nobody has his back, and he's killed. He's actually killed by a scheme of David's. So now it's not only adultery, but it's murder too. <sighs> so, but David laments, finally, after this is all over, after all the problems, he, he laments. In fact, we read about David's lament, how he's truly sorry, how he repents for his sin. Uh, it's a bad sin, but he does repent for it. And we read about that. Actually, Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is, um, is considered David's lament, his uh, true repentance, and how he prays to God for forgiveness. I'll just read a couple of verses to you. Turn away your face from my sins, blot out my guilt. A clean heart cause for me, God. Renew in me a steadfast spirit. Do not drive me from your presence, nor take from me your Holy Spirit. Restore my joy in your salvation. Sustain in me a willing spirit. I will teach the wicked your ways that sinners may return to you. Rescue me from death, O God, uh, by, by saving God. Rescue me from death, God my saving God, that my tongue may praise your healing power. Lord, open my lips and my mouth will proclaim your praise. For, I do not des you, for you do not desire a sacrifice, a burnt offering you would not accept. My 
sacrifice. God is a broken spirit. God, do not spurn a broken, humbled heart. And he goes on. But anyway, it's, it's his repentance. Okay? So some of the Psalms come from David. Um, anyway, at the end of all of this, we had Saul reigning for 40 years, David uh, for 40 years, and his son Solomon for 40 years. Okay? Um, and uh, so let's just review the themes of Judges and First and Second Samuel that we've just done. Okay? Uh, first, when we surrender to God uh, and we're dedicated to God first is when we prosper. Uh, we can do great things. Uh, ordinary people can do extraordinary things um, if we rely on the spiritual power that God would give us. Samson and the strength of Samson, the story of Samson is a, an example of that. Uh, and sometimes God chooses the weakest, not the strongest, uh, like David. All right? Jesse wasn't even going to bring David. Uh, and God can act through us, no matter who we are, uh, if we step forward in faith. And we must admit our mistakes and failings like David did uh, and repent, and God will forgive us as he forgave David. And I mentioned Psalm 51 there. Um, when, by the time we get to 1 Kings, next, the next historical book, uh, the parallel to it is 2 Chronicles. Chronicles are less graphic than Kings. So if you want the kind of watered-down version, Chronicles are, are the watered-down version. Okay? Uh, but the first thing we hear about in 1 Kings is David's death. Okay? Uh, right in the second chapter. And Solomon's rule. Solomon is now the rule. And Solomon, God was willing to give Solomon anything he wanted. And instead of asking for wealth or something like that, he asked for wisdom. And uh, there's stories. I don't have the time, I don't think, to go through them uh, in detail with you. Uh, but there are some great stories in 1 Kings about Solomon's wisdom and how it was displayed. Right? At one time, we had two women claiming that uh, a male child was, uh, was theirs. And it came down to Solomon making the decision of who would get the child. So he said, well, you know what? Well, I'm cutting half. Right. And you both take half. Right. And one of the women said, no, 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 you can give it to her. No. That was the mother. Right. She she would sacrifice, as any mother would, to save her child. Right? It's just a demonstration, a story that's a demonstration of Solomon's uh, wisdom. And Solomon did what David wanted to do, but he couldn't do because of his disobedience and his sin. He wanted to build a temple in Jerusalem. And so the first and the greatest temple ever built on the face of the planet, Solomon constructed in Jerusalem. Right, uh, And this was probably, next to David, maybe it was even a step above David as far as the, the high point of the history of the Israelites. Right? It was a good time in their history, those years. But it didn't last too long. There was the fall of Solomon. And, you know, we read that he had 700 wives. It might be an embellishment. Okay, it, it probably wasn't, but anyway, it, it simply means seven is a number in, in biblical uh, literature for completeness, you know. So, 700 would be very complete. You know? uh, but you know what? We're reminded of that WWW, that's the problem with kings, right? That is that they're storing up weapons and warfare, uh, wealth and wives, right? Which always leads to the destruction, right? All of these, all of these kingdoms, they, 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 they would rise and fall. And that was the fall of, of Solomon, and uh, he actually died in or around 
uh, 970 BC. And so his son is Rehoboam. And he actually does two things that cause a big problem. One, he has a labor inscription, a labor draft. In other words, you, instead of being drafted into the army, which they were, were also drafted into labor camps. And he increased the taxes. Okay? And he caused a civil war. His father, Solomon, was greedy, but Rehoboam was even more greedy. And what he did caused a civil war, and it caused the kingdom to divide. And again, God had warned him about the WWW. And what would happen if they had a king, and they didn't just rely on God to be the king? So now there's a big problem, and that's why we see this, the divided kingdom, okay, in the year this is a significant year. On your last page, I wrote, I circled the important years to know, and I not that this is a test or anything, so don't. If, if, if this was a, an actual course, there would be, but um, lucky for you guys, there isn't none of that. Um, but the kingdom divides as a result of this. The kingdom divides in the year 931 B.C., okay? And over taxes I, is, is here because that was one of the reasons. And the labor inscription was the other reason. Okay, That's what caused this civil war. Uh, and so now you have a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. Uh, and that's very significant. So we've gone through the judges. We've gone through... Uh, well, we didn't, we didn't go through the Ark of the Covenant and how it was captured by the Philistines and then recaptured by the Israelites. Uh, we did talk about Samuel becoming a high priest uh, and Saul being anointed Israel's first king. Uh, about David bring, you know, getting that Ark back from the Philistines. They couldn't keep it. It was too hot to handle. Um, and um, so... He brings it to Jerusalem. He wants to build the temple. He doesn't. We hear all about Bathsheba and all that. And finally, Solomon builds that temple, right? And that's the most magnificent thing on the face of the earth. And times are good, but then there's the downfall, the WWW, and his son Rehoboam causes the division, the split, okay? So here's a map of it. Here's what you have. Uh, you have the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And that northern kingdom lasted for about 200 years. On the map, on the timeline, this is about 200 years. They lasted for 200 years and then they were attacked and, uh, and, in, uh, and conquered by the Assyrians. They were attacked and conquered by the Assyrians. Because at this time, that area, the Near East, was conquered by the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, and then finally the Romans, the time of Christ. Okay? So you had six different kind of world powers taking over that area. But the north here is attacked by the Syrians, and these tribes disappear. The one tribe that was in the south, the largest of them, Judah, remains. And that's where we get the term Jewish and Jew from, Judah. Uh, and um, the Assyrians tried to attack Jerusalem, but they never made it. Okay? They, they, they didn't. Someone else will. Oh, in between the Assyrians and the Persians, there were the Babylonians. And they are significant. So it was Assyrians... Babylonians, and then Persians, then uh, Greeks and Romans. So, um, the divided kingdom is where we leave off. Okay, And there's the map of it. I'll show you a couple other maps in a few minutes. Okay, so we're in 2 Kings, uh, and we, we read about this divided kingdom. And we have Rehoboam in the north, and Jeroboam in the south. These are the two kings. We have two kings now. We have a divided kingdom. Okay? Uh, 
We, there are some other stories at this point of the divided kingdom. There are some prophets. We hear about Jonah uh, and his, um, uh, his mission to Nineveh and him being swallowed by the whale and the whole bit, right? Uh, but then these other prophets, right? These are the earlier of the prophets. Uh, Amos and Hosea and Micah and Isaiah, uh, etc., Jeremiah and Ezekiel. These are important prophets. We'll talk about the prophets in a second. But then we read about a very, very significant thing. The Babylonians conquer uh, Jerusalem uh, under Nebuchadnezzar, their king. And the year is 586 B.C., and they take the Israelites into captivity. It's called the Babylonian exile. They actually have to leave Jerusalem, leave Judah, and go into exile uh, with the Babylonians. This exile is going to last 70 years. And during this time, they have lost it all. They have nothing left. They've lost their land. They've lost their homes. They've lost their wealth. They've lost a lot of their, their own people. They've lost everything. And they are crying out to God at this point. Okay? And um, there are some of the prophets that are prophets of the, that, that divided kingdom. And these are them. In these prophets, we hear a lot about a Messiah, a Savior coming. Uh, and we hear him described in Isaiah as the suffering servant, which Jesus was. Uh, in Daniel, the Son of Man, which Jesus called himself, we hear about the, uh, uh, in Daniel, the temple being destroyed, the new temple and the new covenant, you know, uh, being predicted. Uh, in Jeremiah, we hear about a new David to come. Right, that would be a descendant of David's and another king of Israel but this time a spiritual king. Uh, we hear about a new covenant, different than the covenants, more expanded from the covenants of the past. Uh, we hear that there will be a new exodus, uh, a new freeing of people, this time freeing from sin and the effects of sin through, through Christ and redemption. And Ezekiel describes this, a Messiah as a shepherd, right? A, a guardian of the people, Okay. All right, well, the next two books we're going to do in, in two minutes. Uh, Ezra and Nehemiah. Okay? Ezra could be called, Ezra was a scribe, and could be called the first book of the return. Okay? Uh, and Nehemiah could be the second book of the, of the, uh, the return. Ezra wasn't a scribe, but the king of Israel. Uh, there was a decree, the Persians conquered the Babylonians, and there was a decree by Cyrus the king. In other words, hey, let these Israelites go out of here. All right? We don't want to keep them in captivity anymore. Let them go back to Jer Jerusalem and do whatever they do. Okay? Uh, and we read about, about three kings of the Jews, Jerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah. Uh, and at that time, when they return from the Babylonian captivity, the altar is re an altar is built, sacrifices return. These are the sacrifices that began at the, at the Mosaic Covenant on Mount Sinai. The Temple of Solomon, which was destroyed by the Babylonians, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, is rebuilt. Uh, we read about a second return. A return wasn't all at once. It was in waves. So we read about a second wave of Israelites returning to Jerusalem and even rebuilding the walls of the city. The second temple was never as glorious as Solomon's temple. Uh, and the covenant being renewed again. The people, again, God intervened in their history and set them free once more and returning to Jerusalem and renewing the covenant, saying they will be faithful. Uh, these are the Jews, the actual Jews that will... Uh, that, we, uh, that we talk about today, the Jews of Jesus' time. Uh, the last historical book in the Old Testament that I want to mention is 1 Maccabees. Uh, 
Because after the Babylonians, what happens? A, a man whose name you know, Alexander the Great, okay? And the Greek conquest of the Near East, all right? The Babylonian Empire had fell to the Persians, and it was Cyrus of Pers- Persia that um, kind of freed the Israelite, the, the, the Jews now from Judah, uh, and, um, and they were able, not Israelites, that was the north. These really are Jews uh, from Judah. And um, so there's a difference, and, and that's a mistake to say Israelites anymore. So the Jews returned uh, from their, kept, their Babylonian captivity uh, when the empire fell to Persia. But Persia fell to the Greeks under Alexander the Great. And there were two Greek dynasties, one from Egypt that first ruled the area, and things were kind of okay, but then there was another uh, Greek dynasty, this time from Syria, and that caused a problem from the Jews because they were now persecuted, right? They, um, they were forced to worship animals and... Uh, and Greek gods. Uh, so the, um, there was a revolt called the Maccabe- Maccabean Re- Revolt. Um, and the, the Jews gained back their freedom that they had lost. And the persecution ended. And there was uh, a time of uh, peace before the Near East was conquered by Rome. Uh, Pompey entered Jerusalem in the year about 63, okay, B.C. And this leads us right up to the time of Christ and the New Testament, okay? So we have just done 10 of the 12 historical books. So we did good. I told you we'd get through the 12 of them because this is what's going to bring us into the New Testament. Uh, Remember that the Old Testament or the the Hebrew Bible, uh, what we call the Old Testament, they don't call it the Old Testament, right? We only call it the Old Testament because we have the New Testament, right? So in light of the New Testament, we call the Hebrew Bible the Old Testament. And we break it up into the Pentateuch, the first five books, right? And uh, the historical books, ones that we talked about, uh, and another type of scripture called the wisdom writings and then the prophets, all right? Well, when we say the wisdom writings, we mean these things. The story of Job, the Psalms, Proverbs, things like that. They are wisdom writings. And if you, if you read them, you can see that they are, they're, they're telling people things the, about how to live and how to have a relationship with others and with God, all right? Um, the prophets, here's all the prophets. Actually, the writings of the prophets are a full 25% of the entire Old Testament. Okay? There are major prophets and minor prophets and early prophets and later prophets, chronologically. Uh, and we don't have time to get into that. And that wasn't on our, our list anyway. We were simply trying to give you the history, the stories, uh, what was behind it all. But the heart of the prophetic message, the heart of the message of the prophets was this, that when Israel responded to God's call in trust and fidelity, they lived and they prospered. This is the story of their entire history. But when Israel turned a deaf ear to God, when they started living like their um, heathen neighbors, right, immorality and worshiping false gods, putting things ahead of God, uh, caring more for themselves than others, not caring for those in need. When they did that, they died and they were defeated. And the story of the prophets is, hey, get back to the covenant. Fulfill your end of the covenant. God will keep his end of the covenant and your life will improve. Okay? Uh, and they told Israel this story before the... Um, the Babylonian captivity, they told it drawing the Babylonian captivity and after it. 
pre-exile and after exile, post-exile. Okay? So, you have the whole story. We know how the Israelites got into Egypt and that they became enslaved there. Uh, we know about that judgment that God passed on Egypt and how he set those people free and they were released from Egypt. We heard about their journey to Mount Sinai under Moses and Moses receiving the commandments. But the Israelites not being faithful as usual and worshiping that golden calf. And now every uh, head of every household uh, cannot be a priest, only the Levites, because they didn't, they were more faithful. We hear about the beginnings of, we heard about the beginnings of animal sacrifice. We heard about their refusal to enter the, uh, the uh, promised land, their 30 year sojourn in the desert. We heard about the conquest of the promised land. We heard about the life in the promised land uh, under judges and under the first kings, Saul, then David, then Solomon, building the temple in, uh, in Jerusalem, which they conquered. Uh, we heard about Rehoboam and the, and the divided kingdom, the Babylonian captivity, the prophets, their return uh, under the Persians from captivity, the rebuilding of the temple and the wall. Finally, the Greek rule under Alexander the Great. And once they started being persecuted, um, that's around the year 198 um, B.C. on that Maccabean revolt. And then finally, the area was dominated by the Romans. Pompey entered Jerusalem in 63 B.C. So here is how that area looked um, at the uh, at the at the time, the time of the uh, uh, the time of the Old Testament, Judah down here, Samaria in between. This was this was the uh, Northern Kingdom and Galilee up here. Galilee um, was where Jesus was from because that's where Cana is. That's where Nazareth is. That's where the Sea of Galilee is. Galilee is. That's where Capernaum. Uh, Bethesda, these are places that, that you uh, have heard of. Mount Tabor, uh, this is the Jordan River going down to the Dead Sea. If you, if you want to uh, look at what that area is today, this, these red lines superimposed on it is, this is Israel, this is Syria to the north of it, right? Um, Egypt over here, Jordan over here, right? Uh, just kind of give you an idea of that same area today. And now, you can look at this map and you know everything right up to, uh, look, Maccabean Revolt. Uh, okay, right up to here. All right, well, uh, if you wanted to know more about this, especially about the great themes of scripture uh, there are this this uh, book has actually two of them Old Testament and New Testament and the it's Richard Raw and and Joseph uh, Martos are the all you have to do is Google or go to Amazon and just put in the great themes of scripture uh, and there's two volumes Old Testament and New Testament that's something that I uh, that I w would certainly recommend uh, to get deeper into understanding that. I am not going to talk about the New Testament. We're going to stop because it's 8.30. Uh, there was only a couple of slides left, and I will, I'll, I'll do those before uh, we start next week because next, next Monday, we're going to start a, uh, two sessions, the first of two sessions, on church history. What happened to the church? We're going to go uh, next Monday night. We're going to go from the day of Pentecost, the birthday of the church, uh, to the Protestant Reformation, which was in what year? 1517. Wow. You, you were an excellent student when you were in here. Uh, yes, 1517. Uh, very good. Uh, you notice that he didn't even hesitate on that. He just came right out with it, 1517. All right, so we're going to go from Pentecost to the Protestant Reformation, if we get that far. But don't worry if we don't, because otherwise we'll make it up for the next time, because we're going to go from the Protestant Reformation and what caused it and what happened, how that changed the church. We're going to go from that all the way up to the 20th century. 
And I'm going to tell you everything. The good, the bad, and the ugly are really going to hear the history of, the, uh, of Christianity, the history of the Catholic Church. Okay?